name is Sybil Richardson, and uh, my family is awaiting on a ruling regarding my husband's matter. I was just wondering if you might have any information on, like, an update on it. If no, we don't have anything yet with us on Monday. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. Okay. All have right. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye. This is Sybil Hi. and again. Uh -huh. No, we don't have anything. All righty. Thank you so much. My twins will be 18 next month. They have absolutely no idea what it means to have a father in their house, what fathers even do. Hello. Did you get any word from over at the big house no, today? Anything yet. Nothing yet? No. Okay, you got a chance to call today? I have not. No? Okay. Man, these people have no respect for other human beings' lives. No matter how sane or how understanding you try to be, it just will make you lose your absolute mind. Look at how hard I'm going to be smiling when you come home. Success is the best revenge. Success is the best revenge. You're going to show them that they can't treat human life this way. Success is the best revenge. Just hang in there, because when you get them home, they're going to pay, they're going to pay, they're going to pay. I knew that if it was going to be, it was going to be totally up to me. Hello, I'm Ann Hornaday, Chief Film Critic for the Washington Post. Welcome to Washington Post Live. Welcome, special welcome to our Oscar Spotlight series. We're putting a spotlight on five films nominated for the Academy Award for Best Documentary Feature this year. And today I'm speaking with director Garrett Bradley and Bob Richardson and Robert Richardson, the wife and husband whose story is the subject of this remarkable documentary called Time. Welcome. All Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Great to see you all. Garrett, the film is a beautiful meditation about the passage of time during the 21 years that Rob spent in prison for a 1997 bank robbery. And during those years, his family's life was moving forward as his life stood still. Tell us a little bit about what made you want to tell this story. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much for having us. It's such a pleasure to be here. Um, and I'm very curious, Robert, what your response is, because I feel part of the beauty of the is that they actually were able to come together. And all but to answer the question in terms of how did we um, come to find each other, Opportunity to meet Fox in the process of a short film called Alone um, that was also looking at incarceration from the point of view of the family um, and immediately was able to build a bond with Fox. Um, I just, I loved her right away and I loved the whole family and their story was an important story and it was a sort of natural um, evolution for us collectively, not just for me as a for us collectively to continue to think about how we could fill this void of talking about incarceration from a family's point of view, and the effects of that. Um, and we put that together, and I've been so grateful that, uh, that they trusted me and we were able to work together and in, in, in this time. And Fox, in the documentary, we see these extraordinary home movies that you took for several years as a young wife and mother. You're madly, you're obviously madly in love with your husband, uh, Rob, while you're working on your, on your life together. Um, what drove you to start documenting your life in that way? It's such a gift, it's a gift to your own family and now it's a gift to all of us. But tell us a little bit about, about what made you want to do that. 
Thank you uh, again. And Garrett, you look absolutely lovely today. <laughs> <laughs> I just... <laughs> I just, um, um, for me, it was about being able to, my family was, I was so happy that Rob and I had finally gotten it right, that we had finally built this family. We had been working on for 10 years and, and I just wanted to document it. And then with the choice that we made at our own hands, we lost what we had worked so hard to get. And, um, and then by him being removed, I want to make sure that he could um, continue to be a part of our day-to-day -day activities, that his presence was important, even though he was um, trying to fulfill an obligation for breaking the law. Um, and so my goal was to be able to have this footage so when he came home, he would see, and then as time would pass, and we were still in the system after over a decade, I felt that, it, and I was finding out more, that it wasn't just my family, but this was that our country was notorious for this, that we were locking up more families than any other place on the planet Earth. And then I knew that it wasn't just about telling our story, but I had to document so that all of our stories could be told, the 2.3 million American families that are having this experience. And then I was lucky enough to have an angel sent my way in the form of, of Garrett Bradley, I say that I may have recorded um, the footage, our archive, but Garrett turned our story into a masterpiece. Um, and that's what time is, it, it's a masterpiece. And I understand that the moment that those home movies changed hands was a rather impulsive one. Um, and I don't know if Garrett wants to take this or Fox or both of you to describe that moment when you said, here, take these, this is for you. Garrett was so focused on how she was, what she was going to share, that she had forgotten that, you know, I had mentioned that we had footage. I had even forgotten that I hadn't given it to her yet. And, uh, and it was nothing but the universe aligning that she remembered to ask. And I gave them to her. And, and I think the most remarkable thing about it all is that I had filmed over 21 years and I had never once sat down and watched anything that I had filmed. So to see what she extracted from that, my first time viewing the film after she had finished it with our amazing team at Concordia was um, seeing my family's footage over 21 years in the flash of 81 minutes and it was heart wrenching for even me. And so I can only imagine how it is impacting our world, what Garrett Bradley has created through time, through our story. Garrett, do you want to add anything about what it was like to, to get, I don't, how many hours were there and what was involved in watching them and processing them and deciding what to do with them? Well, I think there's, um, first of all, I think it ended up being about a hundred hours box of, of footage, of material. And, you know, if I'm being honest, every single part of it was incredible, was beautiful. Uh, when one has to edit a hundred hours of something taking into account even what was shot and really have 81 minutes, it's a difficult task. Um, and I think the question that myself and Gabe Rhodes, who cut the film, had to ask was, yes, we understand that the structure, the length of the film is going to have to change. We're going to go from maybe a short to a feature, but the intention needs to remain the same. And so the intention for me was connected to early conversations that I had with Fox and Rob with the family, which was, why do we want to make this film? And I think as, as Fox mentioned, you know, their story is the story of 2.3 million American families. And, and sharing their story was hopefully going to offer hope to people. And I felt like my job then, first of all, the question is, well, is that intention in alignment with my intention? And it was, so we, that's how you create transparency and trust with people when you're making documentaries about what are we doing together? Why do we want to do this? How, how is that intention going to inform um, how we do it and where the camera is and, and all of those things. And that doesn't necessarily change in post-production. So when we were looking through the archive, my mind was, it needs to speak to this idea of hope. How does hope exist for the family in daily ritual, in routine? and an intention, and I felt like it kind of boiled down to probably many, many more things than just three things, but three things that I kind of narrowed it down to with Gabe was this idea of unity, 
you know, this which with which Fox and Robert speak about and the whole family speak about a lot. But unity, what it means to counteract the systematic separation of black and brown families since the beginning of our country, since the inception of the new world, unity resists that. You know, so staying together over the course of two decades is no small feat. It's something that some families where incarceration is not a factor are unable to achieve, which is also something that we talk about that that Fox and Robert and the sons talk about. It was obviously love, love being the premise of all things that that um, that they are coming from in the way that they treat each other and the way that they treat themselves and the way that they treat people who come into their lives, who are blessed to come into their lives. Um, and it's also being an individual, you know, I have to say, and it's funny to speak about you all, you know, in third person or whatever it is, but every single member of the family is an individual, you know, has their own thing that they're doing, that they're excelling at, that they're thriving at. Um, and that also is a huge, uh, it's a huge feat because it also says the system is not going to define me. I'm not going to be defined by the system. So those were three uh, forms of, of resistance and, and articulations of hope that I saw in the family. Um, and I was looking for that in every single frame. And I'd like to think that the film um, speaks to one of those three things or all three of those things, uh, one frame at a time, whether it's the archive or whether it is present day. Um. The, the title time is deeply meaningful. It's densely layered. Time is um, such a fascinating construct and motif and conceit throughout this film. And one way, um, R Rob, that your family marked time was through your incarceration. Fox moved the family to be closer to you in order to be able to visit as often as they possibly could. I think it was twice a month. Um, I'd like to set up a clip that really illustrates this quite beautifully and then circle back. Let's let's watch. All right, it is, um, I think probably about 2.20 in the morning. It is October 20th, and we are on our way. Um, today is the 21st. On our way down to go see my husband. Wow, well, it's time to go see your daddy, man. At the beginning of every year, every New Year's Eve for the past 20 years, we have always started the New Year knowing that this was going to be the year that my husband was coming home. And if you haven't done something in the courts by Thanksgiving, then you know that you're about to end the year and you're still going to be incarcerated. The hope that you've given yourself all year long, or the truth be told, the lie you've given yourself all year long, you have to accept that maybe this just wasn't the year. But next year is the year. Rob, I, one of the things that rings true through this film is how much a part of your son's lives you were able to be, even in that challenging circumstance. Could you tell us a little bit about how you were able to be a father during those 20 years? Um, I guess it all started for me uh, once I read a magazine article once uh, in a uh, men's health uh, magazine. And in there was maybe a, uh, an issue that was dedicated to Father's Day. Um, and it pointed out um, how many hours per month uh, the average father spends with uh, with his child. And surprisingly enough to me, it was um, an average of eight hours. It said that the average father spends about eight hours per month, every 30 days, uh, engaged with their children. So with that being said, um, with two days uh, to visit in the course of a month, uh, I think at that clipping that you showed, it was October the 20th, which was four days on the other side of the twins' birthday. So Fox had come down uh, to, uh, to visit. And it was one of those instances where I had put in for a special visit so we would visit all weekend. 
So it was one of those rare occasions where our visit was extended to be a, uh, a four day visit. Uh, with that being said, just on average, when you get to visit, say, from early in the morning, about seven o'clock or so, and you're able to stay there till three or four o'clock in the afternoon, depending on what your special visit uh, was approved for, it allowed me to be able to engage my children uh, for far more hours than the average father was engaging their children in open society. So with that being said, I had to make the best of, um, of the circumstances that I had been dealt and to fi figure out how it was that I was going to be able to uh, impart uh, both knowledge and uh, wisdom uh, and allow a, uh, enough room uh, for my children to experience life on their, on their terms as well. Uh, so it was challenging, but at the same time, uh, it was well worth it. I think that's an understatement. <laughs> the regard our sons have for their father, people think that, oh, Fox, you did an amazing job with those kids. And I say, you just don't know. When his the, the, the threat in our house was, wait till your father calls home. <laughs> and, and wait, and if it's really a tough situation, it's wait till we get to visit, <laughs> you know? Jared so, mentioned the thing about transparency early on, and that was the, one of the things that was uh, prevalent in our household is that we were always transparent about things. Uh, so it, wouldn't, it wasn't enough for me to uh, encourage uh, for higher education if I wasn't going to seek higher education myself. Uh, so while I was incarcerated, I continued to uh, seek higher education and achieve at different levels as well, marking um, that, you know, if you strive, you can uh, you can achieve the other uh, thing that you strive for no matter where you are. It, it shines right through. And, um, and both of you, to both of you, you've done such a magnificent job. I mean, there is such joy watching these young men come of age. Tell me, a little, Fox, tell me about their reaction. I mean, there are so many, again, layers. First of all, their reaction to you filming them so much, I suppose that just became second nature to them after a fashion, but then What's their reaction been like to seeing it, um, as you said, turned into this piece of cinematic art? Yes, the art, yes. You know, I think for them, what was funny to me, if you notice, is that they love the camera and, and they would become mesmerized by seeing themselves in the camera. So I always just thought it was the cutest thing. So when I see some of the footage that Gary extracted um, again, and I hadn't even watched the, the footage, the archive footage myself yet, uh, I started trying at Christmas and the emotions that came over me within the first 30 minutes just just ripped my heart out. I couldn't take it anymore. So um, I don't even know if I've ever would have been able to watch the footage had it not been for Garrett and this this um, piece of art that she's put together. But the kids, are, I think that they're amazed and they're humbled that we have been able to use our journey and that, you know, it kind of makes the suffering meaningful when you can help somebody else with it. And, and they're getting messages in their on their social media where people are saying to them, other children who have incarcerated parents, other parents who just want the best for their children, um, or best for all of our children in society, uh, are sending encouraging words to them. Uh, we have a big problem <laughs> coming up next month. We've got two college graduations on the same day. And so that's kind of like what life has been for us lately. Oh, that's fantastic. I, this, that, that actually um, invites me to share another clip that really gets to these moments of joy and also the bittersweetness that are, that are involved with the joy. Um, yeah, I don't want to set it up any further than that. Let's, let's watch and then come back around. Is influenced by our emotions. It's influenced by our actions.
and that the biggest hope that you had was that before they turned into men, they would have a chance to be with their father. You know, Garrett, we've never seen a story like this before, but I think that we've seen stories that touch on some of the subject matter before, and I think some of those narratives can fall into traps. And and I want to ask you just about some formal, some of the formal decisions that you were making while you were putting together this film in terms of those traps that you wanted to avoid or certain values you wanted to advance. And I also would love to, for you briefly to talk about this magnificent sound design in terms of both Fox's beautiful voice, that lyrical voice, and then that lyrical piano music that they play off one another just so exquisitely. So tell us all about it. Okay, yeah, well, I think, um, I mean, the formal choices, I mean, there's there's so many different directions that I could, I could answer that question in many, many different ways. Um, I mean, I think first and foremost, I'm invested in the beauty and the strength and the brilliance of people that I work with. Um, and I had no interest in trying to get around that or to undermine that in a way that I think maybe you're speaking to, which is that sometimes I think there's an expectation um, both in documentary filmmaking, but also in scripted films, where to see somebody in their weakness, to see somebody at rock bottom, to see somebody um, vulnerable somehow is more true than when we see them in their strength and when we see them in their resilience. And I am deeply invested in that strength and in that resilience. And I think it is an equal truth to the vulnerability and to the things that we that we that might occur behind a closed door. And so I think to answer your question in terms of direction, that is something as a director um, that I was really focused on um, that can speak not only um, to, to the beauty of the family, but also to other incarcerated families so that they can see their own beauty as well. And they have evidence in mainstream media of their own daily resistance. Um, and then also, I think for those who may not be aware that incarceration is a chronic problem, that it has existed since the beginning, again, as I said, of, of, the, of the new world, um, that they also can find a way to enter the conversation and to, to be a part of the awareness of incarceration from a place that is, again, deeply human, but that is also rooted in a place of forgiveness. Um, and I think ultimately, all of the aesthetic choices, the visual choices, the poetry, as you say, come from those same qualities. They are um, mirrors to, they're reflections of the qualities in the family themselves, the qualities of strength and of love. Um, and I think that the music, I came across um, uh, uh, the woman that you're hearing, she goes by Emahoy, which is sister. She's a, she's a nun, an Ethiopian nun. Um, and the music is from a recording that was made in 1963 of all years. Um, that she um, agreed to do for the purpose of raising money for an orphanage. Um, and Emma Hoy um, was a prisoner of war. She was also a, a pianist, a, a prodigy, and decided instead of becoming famous, she would become a nun and essentially created this own genre of music, which blends Ethiopian and Western melodies together. Um, and it wasn't until I started to actually learn about her story that I felt, wow, wouldn't it be amazing to bring these two women together, but also this this story, you know, the whole family and and this idea of Emma Hoy herself being uh, a sort of uh, radical resistor of a narrative that had been given to her as well. Um, so it's sort of an extension, I think, of of everything that the film represents in some ways. And and then there's just the cosmic reality of um, having beautiful voices, Fox's voice, but also Remington, as we just saw, uh, the poetry of, of the whole family that. Um, that just works real well with the music. You know, we got lucky in that way too. <laughs> well, there's luck and then there's talent and you have both. Um, and I want to, I actually want to dovetail with, with what Garrett said about the, the, the kind of large, pulling that lens back on the incarceration problem. And Fox, you have become an abolition, uh, uh, an activist in this space. You, In the film, you compare mass incarceration to slavery and say you very much are an abolitionist in that context. Could you tell us a little bit more about your activism in criminal justice reform? 
It would be my absolute pleasure. I am a one among Robin Hour, among one of 35 other hubs um, across this country that implement a model called participatory defense founded out of Silicon Valley by um, Debug. And uh, our organization in New Orleans is called PDM NOLA, which stands for Participatory Defense, where we teach families on a day-to-day -day basis legal awareness as a best form of defense. Most of us just don't know the law. I had a master's degree when Rob and I entered the system, but I didn't know the law and I didn't have an understanding of the entire process. And, and, um, and so when it comes to our lives, because when you're faced with charges, your life is literally on the line, your livelihood. You are X out of society when you become a convicted felon. No housing, no loans, no, it, no life insurance in many places. So um, it was important that what we learned, we could teach others. And so when Rob came home and we were able to um, fight for our own freedom and family restoration, we now work to help other families who are trapped in the system um, to, or either uh, embarking upon this system to experience the least amount of harm possible in rectifying these criminal justice situations. Um, everybody does not have to go to prison and prison should not be privatized. It should not be for profit. Nobody's harm should be for profit. And so um, the work that we do now is uh, working on clemency, um, being able to um, su um, support our governors and making the right decision to use the power of their pen to reduce our prison population through the power of clemency. So we have a campaign called Clemency Works, as well as a campaign to free Louisiana's longest serving mother and grandmother. Her name is Gloria Dean Williams, and we call it the Free Mama Glow Campaign. She's done 51 years and um, is awaiting the governor signature in Louisiana. So that is a part of the abolition work. And I just suggest that, you know, anybody that has a chance to view the film might get a chance to just understand whatever their space is. Our country needs healing when it comes to ending slavery, uh, even today. We are running out of time, but I do want to get to at least one audience question. So unfortunately, I'm going to have to ask you to be brief, Garrett, but John Henry from Florida asks how long it took you to complete this documentary and did you have a script or a treatment um, going into the project? Um, I didn't have a script or a treatment. I had intention and that intention was connected to, as I mentioned, um, conversations that myself and Fox and Rob and the family had from the beginning, um, which was what do we want to say and what do we want to share? Um, and that was my guiding light, you know, um, again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, how does hope, um, articulate itself, um, in daily life? And I tried to focus on that every day. Um, and then I think, Fox, you might know better than me, like the overall timeline. I feel like, I know we were editing for nine months total. He started filming, you came and said, Fox, we're in, it was uh, August the 4th, I believe, 2016. Yeah, see, she's good. And I said, we're making history here. Let me get this picture. <laughs> right, right, right. So, I mean, you know, whatever the math is on that, 2016. <laughs> speaking of time, speaking of time, just being a concept, I am heartbroken to tell you we are out of time. Um, it's been wonderful. It's been so wonderful to have you all here. Garrett, Fox, Rob, thank you so much for joining us.